Question here from Chris Johnson for Mary Lovely. Uh, Mary, you said economists were surprised by the amount America, Americans had to pay in taxes as a result of uh, Trump's tariffs. Is there any evidence that Americans instead bought U.S. made as a result of the tariffs? So the, the first statement had to do with the fact that, you know, we felt there was a belief that the U.S. had market power that would force Chinese exporters to reduce their prices to continue to sell into the United States. And therefore, there was some belief that some of the tax would be passed backward to the Chinese uh, exporters themselves. Uh, I think that that uh, view had to do with China, uh, with the U.S. being such a large market. But it also missed the very important fact about U.S.-China trade, which is that much of it takes place uh, from foreign invested enterprises operating in China. In other words, it's, it's multinational to multinational trade or even um, trade within a multinational. So, you know, one part of a U.S. corporation to another. So um, what we did, what we do know now is that most of it was passed forward. Um, now, how much have, have sales turned to the U.S.? You know, frankly, we really don't know. What we do know is that um, because the trade data and the US consumption data are fundamentally different. They're kept by different uh, authorities. Uh, and of course we were hit with a series of other shocks including most recently this year, COVID-19 which really crashed consumption. What we do know is that the tariffs did affect the, uh, the, the value of US imports from China. Causally we think about a 30% decrease on average. So it, they were uh, powerful in affecting uh, flows. However, much of that trade was diverted to other parts of Asia and Mexico. And particularly um, trade that was that is mediated by multinational enterprises. Uh, an example here is, of course, Giant Bicycle, which has been widely reported in the press as shifting its production of bicycles destined for the US from mainland China over to ta its ta factories in Taiwan. So it escapes then t the tariffs uh, and it can continue to export from its mainland, mainland China factories to other locations. So companies that had multiple uh, factories in, in multiple countries were able to shift production in a way that accommodated the US tariffs. So I guess the answer is we don't really know. What we do know is that a lot of it seems to have moved to other parts of Asia and to Mexico, and that leaves very little uh, that has moved back to the U.S. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here about unpaid debts, uh, China's unpaid debts. Biden clearly will be on the money hunt. Um, do you think the Biden administration will go after the unpaid anti-dumping and countervailing duties owed by China, which is over $3.2 billion. Either of you want to take that? It, I mean, Mary might, might have a better response, but I, I think that again reflects a misunderstanding. So when there's an anti-dumping or a countervailing duty, it's paid by the American importer of the product. I'm not clear where that 3.2 billion figure comes from. That might be, duties that are owed by the American importers. Um, perhaps that refers to efforts to circumvent duties, which you do see sometimes where, you know, um, China might be transshipping the product through a third country to try to escape the tariffs. That's something that the Customs and Border Protection tries to pay a lot of attention to. But but yeah, I, I don't know where that three billion figure comes from. But if their money, if there's money owed, it's not owed by China. It's owed by the American importers who brought the product into the United States. Thank you. Um, okay, question from Dan Voke from um, State's Newsroom reporter. Uh, Dan says, can you talk about the impact on the change in administration on agricultural trade? Mary, back to your point about the, um, about the tariffs. Uh, will the Biden administration likely take a wait and see approach or is there anything it can do to encourage more agricultural trade with China? Well, I mean, the approach to, you know, first of all, the, that a lot of the ex imports, uh, the Chinese imports of U.S. agricultural products crashed with the retaliatory tariffs. Uh, the Trump administration main way to try to encourage that was through the phase one deal uh, and very aggressive targets for China in terms of purchasing U.S. agricultural products. 
At the same time, the Trump administration invested money in trying to help farmers create new markets. Uh, as we've, so, for example, we've seen them push uh, with uh, several of our trading partners to get them to lower tariffs on. Um, it may not be; it's not a mainline agricultural product, but it was very important to Maine, which is the lobsters. Uh, pushing to reduce tariffs to levels that were enjoyed by uh, the CPTPP partners, uh, which we could have enjoyed, but of course we didn't because President Trump pulled out of TPP. So they have engaged in a number of ways to try to build markets. The problem is that farmers uh, built those markets in China over a 20-year period. Uh, it's very hard to uh, instantly turn around and create new markets. They're built on trust. Oftentimes it's uh, overlooked that U.S. agricultural products are customized uh, to the needs of their customers so that these relationships represent um, you know, long-term investments by U.S. producers. Uh, so this cannot be turned around on a dime. Uh, how the president, uh, how President-elect Biden will approach this is difficult to see. Uh, as I have said in other places, I think that if there is going to be some kind of rapprochement with, with China on this, uh, there's going to have to be negotiations before that between the Chinese and the Americans that de-escalate uh, the conflict uh, and result in some other wins, I think, perhaps for both sides. So we have to wait and see how this works out. No easy fix. Uh, Sunny, could I just add very quickly, I noticed, um, you know, we had on this call uh, Jill O'Donnell, who runs the Yider uh, Institute for International Trade and Finance at the University of Nebraska. That's a great source for people looking of, you know, what does the farm community want from U.S. trade policy, particularly sort of big Midwest farm community. So there are a lot of good sources out there for reporters in the heartland looking to, to cover these stories. Right. I would add that one of the first um, uh, programs that we did uh, after the pandemic was a program called uh, Where's Our Food? And we had also excellent sources um, from uh, in, across the industry. And you'll see in the chat, um, you can look at the uh, link and in there you will find uh, the previous programs and also you know, great list of sources that I think will be helpful. Um, let me turn from agriculture to uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, and I, Ling Ling, I don't know if you want to answer, take this one or Mary, are U.S. pharma companies, oh, this is a from a reporter in London, by the way, are U.S. pharma companies still investing as heavily in China um, after Trump's trade war has had an effect? You know, I don't know the, the latest numbers on U.S. pharma FDI, for example, into China. Uh, what we do know, though, is that pharma is definitely on the front line in terms of this decoupling effort in uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, and the, Biden, the incoming Biden administration, um, as well as the Trump administration, have, have, have spoken about the need to reshore uh, medicines and medical supplies, as have many other countries. So I would guess, and I don't have the numbers to back it up, that there's a pause for pharma. Having said that, we have to recognize that there is a very, very active um, uh, community, uh, R&D community uh, that spans US, China, uh, and other parts of the world that R&D in this area is truly global, involves talent from all over the world. Uh, and then any sort of talk of decoupling here, I think it uh, really misses the deep and enduring links that will persist uh, in, um, in pharma and other types of biochemical uh, and biological sciences. Uh, Sunny, sorry, I, I apologize for continuing to do this, but, but for people who are looking to track trade and investment in specific industries. I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but Pangeva, which is an arm of Standard & Poor's S&P, they've got a great analyst in London uh, named Chris Rogers and who does a deep dive into all of these. So if anybody has the answer to that question of what's the latest in terms of the, the trends of US investment, he's probably the guy. So I, I would suggest reaching out to him. It's uh, Pangeva is the name of the organization. Okay. Yeah, I agree with Ted. That's a great source, but I just want you should also we should also look for market access. That the Americans have complained that their goods are being kept out of China as China seeks to develop its own 
domestic enterprises. So we should we should be also looking at market access. That is exports, not just investment. Uh, it's clear that U.S. companies are continuing to invest in China. That they they look like the look of the market. China, of course, bouncing back much faster than the rest of the world to the COVID nineteen crisis. So um, we're going to see heavy investment. Much of it, I might add, going in as wholly owned foreign affiliates of, of foreign companies. So the the new foreign investment law that went into effect uh, in January of this year, uh, plus other liberalizations by China, partly in response to pressures on uh, allegations of IP theft, have certainly are changing the landscape for foreign companies operating in China. Okay, uh, panelists, we still have a few more questions. Are you able to, do we need to wrap this up or can you stay on another couple minutes? Everybody good? I, I can stay for um, five more minutes because I need to go to school, pick up my son. I'm sorry. Okay, well, thank you. Um, well, let me take one last question. Um, this is very interesting, not from a, a, a journalist, but very uh, good question on enforcement of the US-Mexico-Canada um, trade agreement. What do you think a Biden administration will focus on most? Rapid response toward Mexico labor conditions, Canadian milk classes, TRQs. What, what's the enforcement priorities for the Biden administration? I, I strongly expect the labor enforcement will be the top priority. I mean, if you look at the political problem that the, the Biden administration has on trade, it has to reassure, um, you know, union leading Democrats that that whatever trade agenda it pursues is consistent with an expansion of labor rights. I throw an environmental protection in there as well. So I think the Biden administration is going to want to set down a marker pretty quickly that it is determined to enforce the agreements that Mexico made under the USMCA and to be seen publicly as enforcing them. I mean, Canadian milk is a problem up in Wisconsin, but it doesn't move votes in the Democratic Party the same way labor rights in Mexico does. So I think that will clearly be, be the priority. Will anything uh, move votes in Georgia, panelists? Are there any peanut issues out there, Mary? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. Ling 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 votes are being counted as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Ling Ling in Beijing wants to make a difference, and you know, there, is there? We've seen, uh, we've seen, by the way, interesting evidence about uh, China, you know, adjusting its own um, its own policies um, with an eye to the U.S. electoral map. Is does China have any interests in Georgia that are relevant here? Ling Ling, you're are muted. You Sorry, um, you know, the, the Chinese definitely have been watching this whole election saga with uh, a lot of interest and amusement. Um, you know, uh, I, I think, um, you know, they're definitely doing their own calculations as well. Uh, during the trade war, I just remember, um, you know, when uh, President Trump uh, first started to levy tariffs on Chinese imports, you know, the Chinese officials um, just looking at the U.S. electoral map which parts of the country Trump supporters. So that's the first batch of tariffs China hit uh, on the US, right? The farm, uh, the farm, pro uh, the farm uh, states, not provinces, I'm sorry, farm states. Yeah, I mean, certainly just more, more seriously, I mean, Atlanta is the hub of express delivery services in the United States and they have been harmed by the slowing of global trade as a result of both the trade war and the pandemic. So from a sort of interest perspective, um, anything that, that, that helps to speed up trade is good for Atlanta's economy, whether that actually moves votes in the Senate runoff, who knows, but, but it, would, it would help Georgia. I, I think it would be interesting to watch if the uh, incoming Biden administration links regional development policies to trade. Uh, some of the advisors have written about this. Um, I was on a call where we had Malcolm Turnbull of Australia saying he would, his first advice to President elect Biden would be to banish the word Rust Belt uh, <laughs> and to move in aggressively with opportunity zones or other types of devices to try to, uh, in, in a sense, fulfill his promise of making a more inclusive uh, economy by, by hooking more of these places into 
uh, foreign market opportunities. That will require him to engage to make sure that in particular, uh, we begin to remove some of the international barriers to US services. Uh, this is basically a service economy. There's so much focus on manufacturing and uh, of course uh, that's important, uh, but it's important to recognize that more than 80% of Americans work in the service sector uh, and that there's a lot of services that the US is a leading service exporter. And there's a lot more room for um, liberalization and services that could uh, open up jobs in these, op in these areas. You know, uh, Atlanta, Georgia economy is changing as, uh, more rapidly than many other places in the US. Yes, and uh, services are key, I think. Uh, and we'll see. It's interesting to watch how they will couple their labor, regional development policies with their trade policies moving forward. All right. And last question, folks. We're going to move from Georgia, the provincial, to the truly global and move over to Africa. We have a question from David Thomas, who's an editor at African Business Magazine. Will the Biden administration reverse current policy and support uh, the Nigerian American candidate as director general of the WTO executive order, presume that would be an easy one to do, right? And will Biden uh, continue to pursue, pursue bilateral trade deals in Africa or attempt to work more closely with the African continental free trade area? I mean, I can take a shot on the, the first two of those. Yeah, I do think the Biden administration will reverse course on uh, on the director general fight. The US is isolated on that. And, and I think all the, by, by blocking her candidacy, the US is just, you know, making more enemies in Geneva. And I think the likelihood of the, the US preferred candidate, who's a very strong candidate herself from South Korea. But I think, I think, yes, the Biden administration will change on that. I think the Biden administration will probably try to finish off the negotiations with Kenya that are currently underway. I think it's gonna be awkward to stop those. So that may be sort of one exception to their no new trade agreements. You could argue that that's a continued trade agreement. I don't expect to see significant new trade initiatives in Africa for a while though. I think like everything else on the trade agenda, the Biden administration is gonna move pretty slowly. Okay. Would love to see them reach out to uh, Dr. Ngozi uh, who is an eminently qualified, as is Minister Wu from South Korea. But now that Dr. Ngozi has been selected by the rest of the pack, I think it's imminent upon us and I think he will support her candidacy.